Hello, I'm Dr. Orlando Landrum, and I'm here to talk to you today about a potential old treatment that is being used in a new way that can help patients that have pain in multiple joints. So as we talk about pain, we know that frequently one of the common causes of pain is that aspect of joint pain, right? And so when we really look to try to get some insight about that, we want to kind of look at a broader scope and take a look at individuals and have an understanding about a treatment option that has less side effects that can be able to be able to provide good relief that's efficacious in nature and that is useful. For those of you who are joining us live, welcome. Thank you as always for being part of our live stream. For those of you who are watching us at a later date in the recorded version of this on YouTube, if you find value to this video, by all means, please subscribe, give us a thumbs up and leave us a comment whether you find this of value or not, as well as questions that you might have. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about low dose naltrexone, and we're going to really give you some insight about a treatment option that really hasn't gotten much publication, much notification, and many physicians and other healthcare providers don't know that much about it. Naltrexone as a whole has been used as an opioid antagonist or reversal agent, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But traditionally, it's been used for people that have dependency on opioids or have the need to try to be able to stop opioids to stop opioids for various different reasons. But what we're talking about is the aspect of low dose, which many people don't know much about and how that could be useful. But first we're gonna back up and kind of give some background a little bit and talk about pain as a whole, right? So when we talk about low dose naltrexone, one of the things that we want to do is get some understanding about what exactly does that mean, particularly within the context of pain as a whole, right? So when we talk about pain as a whole, one of the things that we want to do is look at what's the prevalence of pain? How does that really affect? How does that really potentially uh, impact individuals when we um, assess their overall problems and issues. And one of the things that we see is, as we, particularly as we look at individuals that are 65 or older, we can really see that joint pain is pretty prominent, particularly for those that have chronic pain. It can be as much as 40% of the problem and issue. And some of those things that are included within that are hip pain, knee pain, foot pain, hip pain. And in this particular slide, they demarcate neck and spine pain as not being part of joint pain. But we know neck and back and all of those things actually have joints that are present within them and certainly can cause a fair amount of pain, anywhere from 20 to 45% and hip and knee pain being pretty prominent. So when we um, have that context, one of the things that we really want to understand is that those things, when they affect joints, they affect lives because if you can't move your hip, your knee, your back, your neck, it's very difficult to actually be involved in doing the things that you want to be able to do. So let's say that we could be able to provide you an option that might be able to give you some relief. The question that would be, would be, would you be interested? Would you say, yeah, I, I, I want to know a little bit more about that. And so that's what we're talking about today. And so let's give you a little bit more information. So when we really look at the context of joint and nerve pain, let's break it down a little bit more. So 65% of osteoarthritic pain is present within the neck of the back. 40% um, is musculoskeletal and 15 to 25% of this is going to be present in the joints as we just talked about before. So how is this pain traditionally treated? Well, it's normally treated with the aspect of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or an opioid. So what does that exactly does that mean? So for those of you who need a little bit more clarification, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory are going to be things like ibuprofen, Relafin, Celebrex, medications, meloxicam, like that, right? 
When you start talking about opioid medications, most people are pretty familiar, but it can be everything from a Vicodin to a Percocet to morphine to a bell, you know, other medications that kind of fit within that context. And so are those things benign? As I'm sure you probably guessed, no, but certainly there are some side effects that not everyone really knows things about. So when we talk about that, these are some of the things that we see. So some of the things that we see are the context of for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. So again, things like ibuprofen, aspirin, there's increased bleeding risk. There's a potential for kidney problems, potential for stomach upset and ulcers, as well as hypertension, stroke, and myocardial infarction, right? When you look at opioids, some of the most challenging pieces are going to be things like withdrawal symptoms, nauseousness, uh, constipation, dizziness, headache, all those type of things that could potentially be a problem that's associated with the use of opioid medications. So we know that we have issues with potential side effects, but the other things that really don't always come into play are discussions like cost and whether insurance covers it, how expensive it is. And quite frankly, when we really start talking about medications that could be safe and really useful from a, a different non-steroidal and opioid medications, those that have tamper resistant that protects your family and others who might think about using it inappropriately, many times insurances won't use those as a mainstay. They'll use medications that are cheaper and more affordable for a number of different reasons, but they have other inherent risks that have been there for quite some time. And so before you can get to some of the other medicines which have a better side effect profile, the cost prevent, prevents many people from being able to actually have access to them. And the other thing that we can talk about is the aspect of interactions and whether those medications might have issues with other medicines that a patient might be taking. So things like your high blood pressure medicines, things like diabetic medications, the two don't always go hand in hand, particularly when you talk about things that have uh, utility for different mood stabilizers and other things that can be calming agents. And then finally, do these medications work? And as we know, not every pain medicine really works all that well. If they did and they didn't have side effects and other addictive type tendencies, we would use those medicines even probably more excessively than what we do right now. So are there other options besides interventions and traditional treatments that we've known about? Well, clearly you know where I'm leading. Yeah, there are, right? So when we talk about other potential options that, out, that are out there, one of the things that's out there is low dose naltrexone. So naltrexone itself was first synthesized in 1963. So uh, without perturbing any of our audience and viewers, obviously that was a bit of a time ago, right? And using it in a low dose hasn't really been in vogue, particularly here in the States um, or in aspects of the rest of the world until somewhat recently. So Naltrexone has a number of different properties in the way that it acts and works, but the reason why we think that it may have value is there's a number of different reasons. First of which is narcotic. It's actually an opioid inhibitor. Traditional doses are somewhere around 50 to 100 milligrams, and it's used in the context of addiction and within that context. But when we talk about low dose naltrexone, really what we're talking about is one tenth of that standard dose, so 0 0.5 to 4.5 milligrams. So where does it seem to find value? It finds value in a couple different elements. Is number one, is it mimics uh, certain um, substances in the body that can cause endorphin release, as well as it has an immune response, so it is able to modulate the immune system. So in modulating the immune system, how is that a value? So if you think about having multi-joint pain, right? And you have pain that's present in your fingers and your wrist and your shoulders and your elbow, you can have osteoarthritic pain, but you also could potentially have a rheumatoid or inflammatory process. 
So as opposed to you taking a traditional anti-inflammatory like an ibuprofen, aspirin, like we talked about before, that could cause you problems with your stomach, with your heart, with your blood pressure, right? What if you could be able to modulate that immune system with a safer, more efficacious manner and also have some other benefits as well? So there actually is a paper that looked at this and really assessed it. And it was done by some researchers at Stanford that looked at the use of low dose naltrexone as a novel anti-inflammatory treatment for chronic pain. And one of the things that they did was opposed to just getting a clinical response from patients, i.e. a visual analog scale. So normally when you see a pain physician or other doctor, they will say, okay, what's your pain on a scale of zero to 10, zero being minimal, 10 being more intense, and then comparing whatever different types of measurement or treatment is. But what they looked at was they looked at ESR, and ESR stands for erythrocyte sedimentation rate. It's an aspect of looking at an inflammatory process. There are other elements that also assess inflammatory processes, things like uh, CRP and other um, measures. But this looked at how were their pain changes that took place from the treatment with low dose naltrexone, which is the com component that's present here, versus placebo, meaning kind of like a sugar pill. And what they were looking to see is were there decreases or changes as they evaluate the aspect of ESR, right? And so when you're able to see this value to be able to be decreased, what they were seeing is that there were changes that were present within the context of pain scores, right? Versus a placebo, which was a flat line, there wasn't any change or any aspect of efficaciousness or difference when you looked at ESR. So one of the things that they were able to really kind of met out is that there were differences that were present, okay? So how is this a value? One second, we're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna come back and then we're gonna talk about why this may be a value to you or the people that you care about and how you might wanna consider and why you might wanna consider this as a treatment option for use. Okay, so we're back and today we're talking about low dose naltrexone and its potential value for inflammatory processes, which actually include a lot of other things besides just joint pain. But one of the reasons why I'm focusing on this is actually, it was really interesting. This week I had talked to maybe five different patients where we were fixing one of their problems and they're like, you know, I got a problem with my shoulder. I got a problem with my elbow. I got a problem with my hands. I got a problem with my wrist. I got a problem with the aspect of my ankles. And traditionally, um, those patients may find value in being able to be seen by a rheumatologist. I think rheumatologists are great. I think that they have a number of different treatment options in their armamentarium. And I think every patient should be evaluated by a rheumatologist if they have that capability. However, not every rheumatologist provides treatment options that are broad and without some degree of side effects. Um, so sometimes looking towards another alternative can find can be useful and can be of value. And when you get traditional rheumatologic treatments, most of the time they require things like a steroid type treatment. And although steroids can be able to provide value, they do have some deleterious effects. As we very well know, it can affect the cartilage, it can affect the aspect of bone integrity and strength in the vertebral bodies, which can potentially with long-term use predispose one towards having vertebral compression fractures. It can cause cartilage degradation. It can cause changes within the components of your metabolism and pituitary and other systems that modulate aspects of hormones. So those things have to be used with some degree of cautions. Additionally, we also know that uh, there are certain active biologic agents that are used by rheumatologists, which have a whole host of different challenges at times for the um, components of traditional cellular function, but can provide some degree of value. So why is naltrexone a potential option? As we stated before, 
it has potentially two different aspects where it increases endorphins as well as it has an immunomodular modulatory type effect. So what that means is it has an anti-inflammatory effect by aff affecting different cells, like we mentioned before, macrophages, particularly when it's used in a low dose component. So how well does that affect the average patient? So let's give you some insight about that. So this graph get, uh, is from that same Stanford study that looked at individuals and what was their impression of low dose naltrexone, particularly in terms of how it affect their symptomatology, right? So let's deal with the component right off the bat of minimally worse, because no one wants to take a medication that then provides them some degree of worsening. For most patients, that was only about 10%. The vast majority either had no change, so 30% that didn't really have an improvement of some sort, but there was 70% that had some degree of improvement, right? There was about 20% that had minimal improvement, and then there was 37% that had much improvement, and 13% that had very much improvement. So when I saw this, I was like, well, if that's the case, why aren't more people using this? It doesn't make any sense. I haven't heard about it, and I'm a pain doctor that I think I'm pretty darn good, right? Why is naltrexone not more prevalent? Well, number one, the fact of the matter is this is not a medication that's a brand medication, meaning it doesn't have a patent that has a whole host of money that's being funneled behind it to be able to benefit major pharmaceutical companies, right? So for you to look at studies of this head-to-head -head against other um, treatment options that are out there, there's not really any resources or reason for people to consider doing this for financial backing. So that's one. And two is the use of low-dose naltrexone and how to dose it isn't something that's present um, in most pharmacies. You need a compounding pharmacy to really to be able to produce it. And it was interesting because without knocking anybody, you know, because I didn't know all that much about this, but I, I reached out to a, a pharmacy, which I won't name any names, and asked them about low-dose naltrexone, and they didn't have any idea what the heck I was talking about. They're like, yeah, we can get you the 50 milligrams for naltrexone and get it for your patients. And I'm like, no, I want the low dose. And they're like, 48, 30? I'm like, no, we want much a much lower dose than that to try to really be able to tap in to those effects that we talked about before, the endorphin and the immunomodulatory or affecting the immune system type effects. Those things are huge and key. So when you talk about for the patient's perspective, well, how does that impact them, right? So cost, if you're taking a month's supply and you're paying out of pocket, it's similar to what you'd get for the aspect of a supplement, somewhere between maybe 20 and 30 bucks, right? Secondarily, how would you utilize it? Normally you're gonna take it in the evenings and your physician will start you at a small dose and then at max get you up to 4.5 milligrams. Now there's some other pharmacologic dosing and that, that's probably a topic better saved for another day. But at the end of the day, it's a medication that you can be able to utilize that really doesn't have a lot of side effects that are associated with it. It's been used for a number of decades, um, particularly outside of the US, it's a medication that's FDA approved. We know this already. Um, and on top of all that, its cost is pretty much fairly affordable, right? So when we talk about being able to add a potential element to provide value to patients and individuals that are suffering from joint pain, and we know that there's about a 30% that will either not get any benefit or about 10% of that 30%, they may have a, a slight worsening of symptoms, but compare that to many other medications and the potential deleterious effects that they have medically, whether it's affecting the cardiovascular system, the renal system, or, or GI system, and this does none of that. It doesn't impact the aspect of cardiovascular, it doesn't affect the renal, it doesn't affect GI symptoms, uh, um, and so to potentially try it and see whether there's value, it, I think it makes sense for a lot of patients, particularly if you have multi-joint problems. But where it really has a synergistic effect is that it can be useful 
for those individuals that don't just have joint problems, but also have muscular problems or other inflammatory processes. So what I mean are going to be things like rheumatoid arthritis, things like lupus, things like polymyalgia rheumatica. And so if you have things like fibromyalgia or other things along those lines that look at a myofascial component, there's a lot of value to be had to be utilized for something like this that may not only improve the aspect of your joint pain, but potentially muscular problems at the same time. So for those of you who are um, listening to this, if you want to pose questions, by all means do so. Um, what I wanted to do is to have individuals understand that there are treatment options that are out there that are being evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis and are trying to be able to understand and understood with a, a broader depth of knowledge without huge financial backers behind them to promote products that have a better safety profile, but also can be able to provide value. So as you guys know, we try to provide to our patients on a weekly basis, an understanding of different options for pain relief, for regenerative medicine, and how to be able to really punch pain in the face, get back to leading the life that you deserve. So if you have questions and you really wanna pose um, other insights into this or other, by all means, please hit us up on YouTube at Cutting Edge Pain Relief, subscribe to our channel, add comments, and give us some insight about other topics that you might be interested in. Thank you so much and have a great day.